You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Oh, sometimes I forget how it goes. I think I've explained this before, but I think what happens is it becomes so routine that I don't even think. And then the problem is, it is after 700-ish episodes, it's so routine now that I think I can start having other thoughts. So my mo- my mouth just starts going, and I'm thinking about other stuff. Then suddenly my mouth stops, and my brain's like, wait, what, what are you doing? What's going on here? What What's... I don't know what the thing is. You're, you're supposed to just know the thing. I don't remember the thing. You just say it. I don't. What is it? I don't know. And then I just I get all locked up because I was I was often never never land thinking about other stuff, thinking about what I'm going to talk about. But anyways, welcome. Very glad you're here. Very tired, but that's you know it's becoming redundant at this point. You know I'm tired, and it's just I'm ex- exceptionally tired today. So there you go. What I want to try to do is to get through as many possible episodes without mentioning anything about the coronavirus. Um, I want to call it a promise to you, but I, I can't do that. Unfortunately, this has become something that you can't ignore. So I, I kind of, there's, there's certain things that go through society that I'm like, you know what, this is something people need a break from, so I'm going to make my podcast a refuge from that. I don't think... As a person with a football podcast, I'm going to be able to do that for very long. So I'm very sorry. Based on the way things are going, at the very least, the draft is going to get messed up. So I, you know, desperately, desperately wanted to be your one wet refuge. But not only that, I just want, I want to just say one thing. Just one tiny, incy little thing. And I promise I'm not going to tell you to either panic or stop panicking. I won't. Although I think every single person probably needs a little bit of a tweak in one direction or the other. Can I just make one tiny suggestion? Stop being so mean to everybody. Alright, this isn't fun for anyone. And every single thing I see on Twitter, it's not even about the virus so much. Everybody's doing fine. Alright, Tom Hanks has got it. He sounds in good spirits. He's doing alright. It's just how mean everybody is to everybody else. So let me just try something really quick. And then I promise I'll never do this again, alright? And it's going to help me never talk about this again if you don't argue with me. Because if you do, it's just going to egg me on. So for the sake of trying to understand everybody's point of view, on one side, please stop being mad at people who just care about people. I understand panicking doesn't help anything. As a matter of fact, it's probably scaring some people more than the actual virus is people's uncontrollable panic. I understand that. But... It shouldn't be that hard to be compassionate for people who are very compassionate for people. They care about themselves, they care about their families, they care about other people. They care about the elderly and people that have diseases like cancer and lung diseases. Don't hate them for being overly compassionate and sensitive or whatever, or possibly just rightly compassionate. Stop being angry at them. On the flip side, let me just try to get the other people to understand the other side. As a 33-year-old person, just to give you an example, I have been told we're all going to die and the world's going to end probably 500,000 times in my 33 years on this planet. Guess how many times everybody's died and the world has ended and panic was worth it? Exactly zero times. So it's almost like the other people are kind of like the old curmudgeon, grouchy people on Twitter who just hate everything the Packers do. And they hate every single draft pick. Because on one hand, that's probably the safe place to be because it's probably, you're probably going to be correct that that draft pick is going to be terrible. So just from the standpoint of trying to understand the other side, some people are tired of being told they're going to die all the time and are tired of being told to panic and be scared because there's a hole in the ozone layer and there's too many people on the planet and everything you eat is going to kill you, and when, you know, Y2K, the world's going to crash, and the Mayan calendar is going to kill you, 
and there's mosquitoes that are carrying diseases that are going to kill you, and this is going to kill you and kill you and kill you and kill you, and they're just they're just kind of tired of it. And they've become a little jaded. Are they the most pleasant people on the earth? Maybe not, but just try to be understanding, all right? We don't need to slash each other's throat over nuance. Everybody knows the numbers. We don't have to keep throwing that back in each other's throat. Everybody understands that. We get it, all right? We know. Just be nice, please. And I know that sounds weird coming from your resident grump on, on, on all things everything. It's just because this is not fun times, and you all are making it much worse for everybody. Stop being so angry all the time. Relax. I don't care if you believe it or don't believe it. Just wash your hands and be nice, okay? Because at the end of the day, 14-year-old Marcus is not the head of the CDC, so we don't have to worry about that guy. Okay, no more comments about it. That's just it's my plea to you, and that's it. We're done. Outside of the part where little tidbits of news are going to pop up. But for, for today, that is all. Anyways, as for today, um, there was a little thing I did a while ago that kept getting buried. I want to go through that today. I don't know exactly how long that's going to take. But um, Dane Brugler, and this is one of the things I've been talking about, The Athletic. One of the in-depth kind of articles that apparently he does every, well, was it even around for the draft? It must have been, I guess. Yeah, I guess. So for the last two years at least, basically saying, here's who needs to have a good day at the Combine or whatever. And so what I did is I went back and looked at that and then looked at the results to do kind of a results-based episode. Now, I know it's a little past that, but it's still relatively good information, and I want to do it now before we get too far down the road. And uh, otherwise, there's some other news and notes that I would like to get to. If that doesn't take up all the time, then we got questions. There's, there's plenty in the pipeline. But please make sure you uh, are in the Pack and a Podcast Facebook group. Make sure you like the Pack and a Podcast Facebook page. If you'd like to support the show, there is a link to Patreon. You can uh, support the show for as little as a dollar a month. There are giveaways. Occasionally I put stuff up on there. If you're wondering, by the way, what's going on with that last giveaway, because, hey, you told me that there was going to be some kind of a t-shirt. It's in the works. Supposedly, the design is supposed to be done today. I will be giving that um, to our winner for review, etc., etc. A um, little bit nervous, because the guy has not even reached out to me yet in terms of uh, progress or anything. So, we'll, we'll see, but... Trust me, it's a thing. It's not like I just didn't um, assign a winner and I'm just brushing it off and say, he's not even doing giveaways, is he? I am, I promise. It's a thing. I just forget to talk to people sometimes. But anyways, why don't we take a break and discuss some more lighthearted things. Today's show is sponsored by The Athletic, which is a subscription-based sports news site for real sports fans. They have got thorough, in-depth coverage from local writers as well as some very, very intelligent and um, in-the-know national writers like Jay Glazier, Mike Sando, Mike Lombardi, like I've mentioned. The Athletic is setting a new standard for sports news. They've got no ads, they've got no pop-ups, and they've got no clickbait. Just great sports writing that tells a story behind the story, which is really kind of the... that's become my favorite part. Also kind of keeps me grounded, because I... I like thinking about theory, but if I don't have somebody to actually tell me what's really going on behind the scenes, I go off into conspiracy theory territory, which, granted, is a lot of fun. It That is a party over there, but it's nice to kind of be either confirmed, like sometimes it's like, yeah, this is what's going on. It's like, look, I'm a genius. Sometimes it's like, whoops, let's get out of there, and hopefully everyone forgets that I mentioned that thing. Apparently that was dumb. I like hearing from the people in the know what's going on behind the scenes. That's That's a really fun aspect and the athletic does have that as a subscriber you're going to be able to download an app get your own personalized news feed you got uh, live writer q and a's and a lot more so just download the athletic app pick your favorite team the athletics is going to be popping up the news just for you and if you right now want to take advantage of the deal just for my listeners go to the athletic.com slash overtime they're going to give you 40 percent off a yearly subscription that is the athletic.com slash overtime i thank you very much Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself 
So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. All right, so again, this is an article that is uh, from The Athletic, uh, Dane Brugler. Basically, he's going drill by drill, giving a, a brief overview of what the drill is what it's looking to gauge, and then gives a little blurb about what um, some of the scouts' take on this drill is. Surprising, or not really surprising. Half of these drills, most of the scouts' takes are, this is dumb and it doesn't matter and we don't really care about it. But then the extra important part is, below that, there's the part of who's expected to dominate this drill and who is expected, or who, who needs to do well in order for them to either not fall or to really rise. And his person was Justin Jefferson. And not surprisingly, Justin Jefferson has been one of the fastest rising wide receivers. Here's what he said about Justin Jefferson. This is the wide receiver out of LSU. This is very interesting, especially for Green Bay Packers fans, because there's, you know, as far as odds go, there is a very good chance Justin Jefferson is a Green Bay Packer. Obviously not good chance in terms of above 50%, but absolutely put him on the list. Here's what he said, uh, Brugler that is. Jefferson is is a seasoned route runner who attacks defenders at the stem to work his way to open space, but he isn't a burner who will simply blow by NFL defensive backs with speed. Jefferson doesn't need to run a 4-4-5, but in a stacked wide receiver class, a 4-5-2 time will look a lot better than a 4-5-7. In other words, if he runs slow, they're gonna, scouts are going to look at that, compare that to the tape, and say, look, I don't know, I'm a little concerned about his speed. The dude ran a 4-4-3. The hope, and, and listen, this isn't, I, I, I don't believe for a second this is Dane Brugler's assessment. The guy is talking to scouts and, and gathering information. That's my assumption anyways. So this is scouts who watched the tape. This is guys who have gone to see him in person at LSU saying, look, if, if we can just see low 4-5s, we're going to feel good about the guy as a well because because speed isn't his thing. We love him as a wide receiver, just don't be slow. The guy's fast. 4-4-3. Four, four, so not only does this guy have all the attributes you want and is not slow, he also is very fast. Now, if it doesn't show up on tape, I don't know how much of that 4-4-3 four, four, you can necessarily credit him with. And maybe he's rising up the boards too much because play speed is a real thing and and I think this is one of those things when you hear guys like Brian Gutekunst say we got to go back to the tape. They're going to want to do that with Justin Jefferson because you want to know if you can actually see it or possibly your job at that point is to assess why is there a difference? Is there something that we can coach him on? Can we get that 4-4-3 out of him? That's another one of those things um, that, you know, I forget which podcast it was. I think it's Chris Landry talks a lot about that when he was doing a lot of this. There are certain players, I don't remember who he was referring to, that they just figure out certain things, like little things like guys have hearing problems, guys have vision problems. And when those get corrected, I mean, there were guys who were expected to be like late round picks, like seventh round picks that ended up getting picked in the third round because somebody gets a little tip about this little nuanced thing that they're doing or the ailment that they fix. And, and the guy went on to be like a, a pro bowler because this little thing most people were seeing that were like, I don't know, he's, he's not great. It got tweaked and boom, he's amazing. So I think the point is, if, if he's if he's legitimately a 4-4-3 and, and that somehow can be evident on the field, he is going to be a very hot commodity that might not make it to third. Um, and, and again, already he's he's flown up. He was sort of a, what, what number five, six, seven-ish down the board, second round-ish guy. Some people, I mean, some people were talking about him at 30, but even I was like, eh, I don't know. According to what I've seen, he's more of a second round-ish guy. Once the combine came along, just flew up so this was a big thing for Justin Jefferson and not only did he meet expectations he wildly wildly dominated expectations now there are more people than just one that you know need to have good times this that or the other but obviously you know Brugler's just picking one and we're just going to go through those people just to kind of see maybe to learn a little bit about prospects but also kind of see what had happened um the second person that he had listed was um safety Antoine Winfield out of Minnesota Similarly, right, very good player. It says he's a smart, opportunistic player with the instincts to go big, to go big play hunting. I don't know what that means. I guess I do, but I've just never heard that before. But it says his below average size and speed leave very little margin for error in the NFL. How he runs in the 40 will be important. Now, again, remember, 
play speed is it, some people might still say, I don't care what he ran in the 40. He's slow, especially when you're talking about like linebackers and safeties, because a lot of that, as I've talked about before, is processing speed. You have to be able to see what's going on and attack at the right area at the right time. And that's how you get where you're going. Straight line speed is, is maybe half the battle. However, the average speed, and this is another thing he lays out, for a safety is a 4.52. He is being pegged prior to the combine as slow. He ran a 4.45. So he is way above average in terms of speed. So that was a great time for him, by the way. For wide receivers, the average is 4.49. So again, n- not only is he um, about average, he's, he's way better than average at 4.43, talking about Justin Jefferson. So anyways, that that is... That's that's what we're doing today, if you got caught up. Next up is the 10-yard split. By the way, the 40 time measures vertical speed and acceleration, and they said that it's mostly beneficial for receivers and corners, which makes sense. Who's running 40 yards, receivers and corners? The 10-yard split measures initial quickness and burst. 10-yard split, by the way, is just the first 10 yards of the 40-yard dash, which obviously is, is much more beneficial because much more people do run over 10 yards. And it's also how quickly you can accelerate, right? Some people are a little slow out of the gate, but, you know, we always talked about Jordy had long speed, like that speed really built up over time. So by the time he got 10, 15, 20 yards down the field, he's really cooking. But for most people, especially when you're looking at guys who work in smaller spaces like edge rushers or whatever, that initial speed is much more important. And that's what they go on to say. It, it says, so it's initial quickness and burst, much more useful than the 40 yard because you're talking about quick t- quick twitch and burst, which is universal. Every player needs that, whereas the 40, not everybody runs 40 yards. Primarily, or especially, this is important when you're looking at edge rushers, right? That initial burst off the line, super important. So anyways, the, the guy that is highlighted as somebody that was expected to shine was Patrick Queen. Said he's one of the most explosive players in this year's draft class. They said he should be well below the average. The average was 161. And they actually said he could be close to some of the other LSU guys that blew this out of the water, such as Deion Jones, who ran a uh, 1.52. He he very close to, he basically met expectations. He ran a 1.55. So not quite as fast as Deion Jones, but very fast linebacker. And again, beyond the expectation of 161. Again, I'm, I'm highlighting that because, I mean, if you're expected to do it and don't do it, that's kind of the same as you're expected to be slow and are fast. It's just a lot worse. It's it's worse in the opposite direction. So for Patrick Queen, it's it's one of those things where it's like we really like you, but you have to show us that you're actually as good as as what shows up on tape. Otherwise, we're going to be concerned. And he did. Unfortunately, he got hurt doing the 40 yard dash. And I don't remember. It's either Kenneth Murray or Patrick Queen. I think it's Kenneth Murray said he's not going to participate in his pro day. Which you know, I guess I get. I mean, they both ran really fast. But anyways. Um, as far as people that need to do really well, A.J. Epinesa was the big one. Now, the problem is, as I've talked about before, I'm not a huge fan of A.J. Epinesa. He's very stiff. And that's my, that's, well, I mean, that's everybody's issue with A.J. Epinesa is as much as the Speed Ben guys, the, the league is sort of getting away from that a little bit. You got to still have it, right? You like to have that in your toolbox. And r- really, it's just a matter of the reason a lot of these Speed Ben guys aren't quite as good as what people expect is because you really need to be more versatile than just having one thing in your toolbox. And AJ Epinesa is basically the same thing, except he's just a power guy. And that at the end of the day is, is just about as useless as just being a speed bend guy. Maybe even more so because, you know, there are certain guys who are just so fast that certain tackles just can't handle it. There aren't going to be a lot of tackles that can't handle power. You know what I mean? Once you get to the NFL level, but anyways, the, the thought on Epinesa was, here's a quote, Epinesa doesn't need to test like an elite ath- athlete, but he can't test like a below average athlete. They said a 10-yard split under 165 would be good, but anything under 1.6 would be great. He ran a 1.81. So if you want to know why Epinesa is sliding, he had a terrible combine. It's, it's, in other words, it's worse than people thought. In terms of testing, they were hopeful that he could do X, Y, and Z, and he was way, way, well below that. So again, I tend to agree that maybe putting on size and trying to play more inside as a 3-4 defensive end or whatever is his best bet. But again, I'm, I'm on the record saying I don't think that's going to work. Now, I, I don't know, but again, I, I can only go based on what I've seen. And what I, from what I've seen, him on the inside is a nightmare. Now, what most people say is, well, he, I mean, he's, he'll be a good rusher from the... I, I, just, I, don't, I just don't get the mentality that we just don't care if he can play the run. Right, he's going to be really good as a pass rusher. That's cool, 
But if you're just getting blown off the ball against the run, you're, you're a liability. That doesn't make you a good player, and it certainly doesn't make me want to take you in the first round. I mean, you can't get guys that are decent enough pass rushers that are terrible run defenders in the second, third, fourth round. And maybe you don't think he will be, but I'm just saying, what, and again, I've watched maybe three games of his, and most of his are outside, but when he goes inside and when it's a run play, every time he just gets pushed out of the way like he's not even there. So, I, you know, again, maybe if he puts on 10 pounds, that won't happen. But I, I can't just say that that's going to happen because I, I cannot see the future. All I know is right now he can't do it. And I'm not going to waste a first-round pick on a guy that I've never seen do a thing that I want him to do. And I can't just make up scenarios. right? I can't just tell a corner to put on 100 pounds and play tackle. Right, that that's just not how things work all the time. Um, anyways, short shuttle. Short shuttle measures agility and lateral movement. Jerry Judy obviously was expected to dominate this. Unfortunately, Jerry Judy kind of underwhelmed in every category, and we're starting to see Judy fall quite a bit. And it's a weird thing because you can absolutely see his agility on tape. That's the one thing. I mean, it's it's one of those things where I always say that. As somebody who's not a scout, and I don't try to pretend to be, I understand how much nuance and work and training goes into that. There are certain people that just make it easy on you. Jerry Judy's one of those guys. Now, there's a lot of nuance that I don't necessarily see in Judy, but his ability to just fly off the line and just make sharp cuts and just look like he's just floating on air is so ridiculously evident. It's shocking. So here's the full thing that was said. A polished route runner, Judy does a masterful job shifting gears with his start-stop quickness. That should translate to a drill that measures the agility to stop on a dime and burst in the other direction. The average in this drill for a wide receiver is a 4.22. Jerry Judy did it in a 4.53. The RAS grade he got in agility was a 0.87. It was under 1. Agility was his worst grade. Granted, overall, his RAS was not that good to begin with, but agility was, it was abysmal. So... Just kind of shocking, I guess. I don't know if that's something that, as a scout, people care about, because, again, it's there. Or is this something you should be worried about, because he's just it's not going to work in the NFL. This is absolutely not going to train. I don't know. I'm not sure what that means. Very, I mean, it's, it's just kind of shocking. I mean, this should have been a no-brainer, but uh, apparently it wasn't. Another guy expected to dominate this primarily because he had done this before and it was recorded, but John Reed, a cornerback out of Penn State, I guess he was recorded recorded at Penn State running this in a 397. They said anything under 4 seconds is elite. He ran it again in a 397. It was confirmed at the combine so absolutely elite agility from uh cornerback John Reed out of Penn State. Guys that they that who needed a strong time. Number 1 was Ezra Cleveland. It's a guy that I was asked to uh, to watch a while ago. Again, I I had mentioned that I like him and he grew on me over time because he seems Seems kind of big and strong, even though in the initial stages he was getting worked. But especially in the run game, he just gets like this extra kind of a bull attitude and just plows people out of the way. But the thought was for him, and again, this is what made me nervous, is he kind of reminded me of Jason Sprigg, is that he's not doesn't have ideal length or power, but his athleticism is what's going to make him kind of stand out. And the, the thought was if he can post any time under a 4-5, that would put him in exclusive territory. In other words, very rare athlete. He ran a 4.46. The average is a 4.73. So he was under a 4.5. 4.5 is that benchmark for a tackle that if you're under that, it's kind of like running under a 4.4, I guess, in, at, in the 40 time for a wide receiver. If you're in the four threes or less, you're in super awesome territory. He'd have gone to, on to say the guys like Taylor Lewan have a 4.49. Anthony Costanzo, 4.4, who's a complete freak, apparently. So that, that's going to be a big thing for Ezra Cleveland, and it's going to get people really excited. Again, makes me super nervous because I hear about a guy that's not super strong, not super, super long, but he's super athletic. See? there's There was like four supers right there. Now I'm starting to hear it. What, what, I don't know. Maybe I crazy strong? Amazingly strong? Those are not great words. I'm sticking with super. Incredibly would work. Too long of a word, though. He just reminds me of Spriggs in that regard, and it makes me nervous. And that's that's kind of an, an unnecessary thing. It's kind of like my fear of Mims because he's like MVS, which is dumb. Because it's it's liking all those positive attributes. He has all the positive attributes of MVS, and we don't know about the negative attributes. Seemingly, he doesn't have the negative attributes. Meaning, you should be extra excited about Denzel Mims if you're a Packers fan. Because it's like, dude, this is this is MVS, but the version of him that we always wanted him to be. 
but the irrational side of me sees him, hears about MVS, and says, I don't want to get excited about that and, and, and uh, watch it fail again. Makes no sense, but it, it makes it's kind of like uh, Josh Jones, the tackle. Don't want him. His name's Josh Jones. Sorry. We drafted a Josh Jones. It was a failure. Don't want to do it again. Wildly irrational. But you know what? Draft season, we know almost nothing. I, I'm, I'm okay with being a little irrational sometimes. Anyways, looking at the vert, which is looking at lower body explosion and leaping. Guys that were expected to shine, Isaiah Simmons, obviously, and without needing to elaborate, he did. He dominated absolutely everything. Uh, beyond that, the reason this in particular, he was a state champion in the long jump, so this was expected. He jumped 39 inches. Now, for linebackers, you're expected 37. For safeties, 36.5. Um, so regardless of what position you want to call him, he outjumped everybody. He exceeded every average that exists. Guys that needed to have a strong result, Mackie Becton, offensive tackle out of Louisville. The blurb on that, offensive linemen don't jump, so why would his vert matter? Because it helps measure lower body explosive traits, especially for a bigger body like Becton, who tips the scale at 365 pounds. Anything above 30 would be an elite result. He didn't end up jumping, so we don't know. However, I think he proved that he's an elite athlete through this process. So, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because he knew he wouldn't be able to do it, so he figured he would just highlight the things he does do well. I don't think too many people are worried about him. He did a great job at the Combine for his size, and he's going to end up going very early as a result. Uh, looking at the broad jump, again, lower body explosion, but also looking at balance. Obviously, you got to jump a long way and then try not to fall on your face. Apparently, according to one of the scouts there, he says this is entirely useless. There is no data to support that the broad jump has any correlation to being good at absolutely anything. This is not the only drill in which they say this. So it's, it's you know, it's kind of just one of those things where it's good for television. You know, this is an Olympic event for NFL hopefuls. So the bench and the broad jump and whatnot, whatever. I mean, it, it's still looking at lower body explosion, I guess. But as far as the scouts are concerned, they don't care about this drill at all. Guys that were expected to shine, though, Jalen Rager. It wasn't really even a question. Apparently, as a senior, Rager set the nation's best mark in the long jump. He won the state title. He definitely met expectations. He jumped 11 feet, 6 inches. His vert was 42 inches, so his jumps were just ridiculous. Unfortunately, he kind of underwhelmed everywhere else. His agility was terrible, and his speed was just average. And I'll be honest, it, it does make me nervous about Rager, because a, a big part of what he does, granted, I mean... The jumping was awesome because he's a smaller guy that can outleap everybody. So you see that on tape, and it's pretty impressive. But that was one of the, the parts of the toolbox. The biggest thing for Rager, though, is that he's a blazer, that he can run in the four threes, that he can run past everybody. I mean, you can run him on the jet sweeps. You can have him doing everything. And it turns out he can't run. Now, we have to see. Hopefully, when the pro day rolls around, because there's a lot of talk about the timing and the schedule really messed everybody up. And we've already seen one person massively improve their time, which I want to talk about at a later time. But I'm, I'm very, with him and LaVisca Chenault, I'm very hopeful that they run at their pro days, and I'm very hopeful that they, they run a lot faster. Because the fact of the matter is, if Jalen Rager has average speed, and I, I know it doesn't look that way on tape, so I don't know exactly how to process that. I know they say trust the tape, but I mean, literally, you can't outrun somebody with 4-3 speed if you run in the 4-5s or 4-4s or 4-6s or whatever. I mean, it's just, it's just, that's pretty basic, pretty basic, whatever you want to call it. It's not even really math, is it? It's just looking at two numbers, which one's bigger. I guess it's like kindergarten math. So a little bit concerned about that. Again, Jerry Judy's another one that you kind of look at and go, mm, I don't know. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, not great. The guy that needed the strong result was Geno Stone, a safety out of Iowa. Another guy that's just kind of a smart player, assignment sound player. Doesn't make a lot of mistakes, but undersized, not super fast. So the thought is, well, if he, if he can at least jump... That's something. Unfortunately for him, for Geno Stone, absolutely horrible workout. His overall RAS was a 298. His broad jump was uh, 9 feet 8 inches. The average is 10 feet 4 inches. So he's about a foot under what he needed to do. A foot under the average for a safety. So very, very lacking athletically. He's probably somebody that, I mean, I don't know if he necessarily goes undrafted, but it's certainly in that territory. I don't know where he was to begin with. If, if his, based on his assignment soundness, he was like a second or third round player, which I don't think he was, then maybe he'll just go late rounds. But if he was already a mid to late, he's going undrafted or might not even end up in the NFL with those numbers. 
Then we get to three cone. This is everybody's favorite, or most, a lot of people's favorite. I don't know. But I think among scouts and whatnot, this is the one that tells the, the best, has the highest correlation to being an actually good athlete. Um, it measures agility, flexibility, and change of direction. It's also different than the shuttles because it's not stopping and going again. This is one fluid motion, right? You just keep moving. So you got to have speed through your change of direction. So somebody that was expected to have a great time was Kyle Duggar, linebacker slash safety out of Lenoir Rhein. Didn't run the drill, but overall did pretty much dominate. Plus, he's already posted a 6-7 three-cone last spring. So I don't think it's a situation where he didn't run simply because he knows he can't do it because he's already been seen doing it. So it's kind of one of those things that we, we already know. Kind of like guys that broke records in high school. It's like, well, we know. Guys who needed good times, Isaiah Hodgins, wide receiver out of Oregon State. The problem with Hodgins is that he's very stiff. He's very upright. He's very stiff. So the hope is if he can show a little bit more more hip flexibility going in and out of his routes, it'll give some optimism. The number that he was given is he needs to be able to come in under seven seconds. He ran in 7.01. I don't know what that means necessarily. Is is seven the absolute cutoff for him where they're saying if you can't even get under seven, this is terrible, or are we saying under seven would be good? He ran literally one hundredth of a of a second to I guess two hundredths of a second because if you want to be under seven, you, you know, is this close enough territory, or is it because he ran a, over seven, he's kind of cut off? The bottom line is, I guess in a sense, this kind of confirmed that he's a little bit too stiff, and uh, it's not great for Isaiah Hodgins out of Oregon State. The average in this drill, by the way, for a wide receiver is six nine three. Another guy that uh, people were very optimistic about and hoping to have a great time was Curtis Weaver, edge rusher out of Boise State. Now, he didn't do a terrible job. He actually beat the average, but the point of this wasn't hoping that he's not below average. It was, do you have sort of elite skill sets? Are you an above average athlete is sort of the question. So the average is 7-1. He ran 7 on the dot. And again, this was another um, another one where the hope was, can you be under 7? Now, again, This isn't comparable to wide receivers because wide receivers generally do better. So it's not like he's as athletic as Isaiah Hodgins. No, no, no. He's much more athletic in terms of positional, you know, looking at it from position to position. So for Hodgins, 701 is a really bad time. Weaver, 70 flat is not bad. But again, the hope was he would be under that seven mark, which really would kind of take him over the edge. That would be the thing that would be like, oh, okay, now, now this guy's legit. He didn't quite do it. He's just got average bend, I guess. So it's just kind of a whole hum, like, eh, all right, whatever. He is what he is then, I guess. We're not going to give him any extra credit for that. Then finally, the bench, another one that has seen to be uh, pretty useless, but obviously we're measuring upper body strength. More than that, we're kind of just measuring how much you can bench. If we're, <laughs> if I can be specific, that's really all we're measuring. But somebody expected to dominate was Simon Stepaniak, offensive guard out of Indiana. He was on uh, the Bruce Feldman's freak list, which is another thing you can get on The Athletic. Comes out every year. It's just kind of things to come, guys that are going to end up being freaks in one area or another. But um, apparently, prior to doing this, he had already done 225 41 times. He only did 37, but when I say only, that's just compared to what we know he can already do. So he came in not quite able to do that, but so what? The average, even for an offensive guard, is 28. He did 37. So everybody, he's a, he's a gym rat. That's what we know about it. The, the guy goes into the gym, dominates the gym. And yeah, he's going to be a lot stronger than, than the guys he goes up again. It doesn't quite super matter, but it kind of does a little bit. I think it gets you a little. I, I have to assume you get a little bit of ex, of excitement, assuming he can do everything else, if the guy can bench 225 41 times. Because you want to see him bench press a defensive tackle once in a while. Just Just push him straight on his back. It's not going to happen very often because everything's about technique, footwork, where you put your hands and all that kind of stuff. But occasionally, you catch a guy just right, especially if you're catching him from the side. You know, you're doing a little bit of a combo block or you're blocking down and you catch a guy right in the shoulder and just knock him off his feet. It's got to be a little satisfying, right? I remember, I was excited about Corey Lindsley for that reason. I remember we had another center. Corey was competing for that job and, I, and Corey was just an absolute gym rat. I don't remember what he did, but he dominated the bench. And for that reason, I was like, man, I just want this guy to do it. He ended up winning the job, and I was very excited about that. Anyway, somebody that needs a strong result, I put needs in quotes because I don't think anybody super cares, but Cameron Dantzler, cornerback out of Mississippi State, the, the the bottom line is he's a small dude, right? Super long, super lean. See, the supers again. Very long, very lean, 
Bottom line, he didn't participate, which kind of just makes sense. It doesn't matter, and why put it in people's heads that he's just too small and, and too weak? I mean, if people know it, just don't confirm it for him. Right? If you can do like three reps at 225, or I mean, I'm assuming he can at least lift 225. I don't think you can even play college athletics without being able to bench 225. The, the biggest problem for him, though, is that it's almost as though he probably should have because he was such a massive disappointment in every other drill. This is at least an area where hopefully he could have shown some kind of a, a hope or a glimmer of hope. Like, can you get to 10? I know the, the benchmark that Dane Brugler put out was 15 reps. But, I, I mean, he was, he was as far as, you know, looking at his RAS or whatever, I didn't take a note of it, and I don't want to look it up right now. But I know it was just, it was terrible. So very, very underwhelming for a guy that I know is at least some people had hoped for being a, a possibly decent prospect. But um, not great. But anyways, that's the end of the list. Why don't we take a quick break? We'll come back, talk about a few other little points. Then we will get out of here. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. All right, since we're on the topic, some very, very good news out of UW. i got to see if I can find a way in there someday. It's literally right down the street from me. I guess not. it's not literal, but it's very close by. i got to find a way to sneak in there and watch the pro day someday. But anyways, one of the more disappointing things, especially for uh, you know Badger fans, was Quintez Cephas. A lot of people super, super excited. Uh, a lot of people very, very excited about Quintez Cephas. Unfortunately, his 40 time was so bad, it was undraftable territory. He was laser timed at the UW Pro Day at a 4.56. That is fantastic. Now, it's not fast, but 4.56 is NFL speed. That is more than fast enough. I am positive at this point that he will be getting drafted. Very, very, very happy for Cephas. Now I have to go back and watch him because once I basically wrote him off. And again, this is why I'm excited about the Pro Day. I mean, again, there was a lot of talk about some guys just weren't ready. The the timing and everything else, it was just terrible. So I'm hoping, again, LaVisca Chenault, I really like his speed. He didn't have any at the combine. I'm hoping he can show to be at least a little bit fast because, that, for me, that was a big attribute. He's got all the other stuff that I really like, but the one thing that stood out is he has all this and he actually looks pretty fast. So I know he's got core surgery Hopefully, he's going to be okay to do his pro day. And, and that's another thing that's getting messed up, by the way, with the coronavirus. Apparently, teams are actually pulling their their guys from doing all this traveling and going to these places, obviously, where there's a lot of people. So that's causing problems as well. Although, I, I've always thought that the actually traveling there thing was, was a little bit overrated. I'm sure being able to be there and talk with the guys is a big part of it. But, I mean, come on. I don't think you're supposed to be really having meetings outside of the official meetings anyways. So as much as you want to be able to actually have conversations with guys, if that even happened, if that's not what's going on at these things, just have them set up a camera and you can all sit around and watch the guy. I, I still feel like as much as it's it's beneficial to be there, and I'm sure that it is, the amount of resources required to have people drive around that much, I don't know that that's the greatest use of, of everybody's time. I mean, you could set up a conference call after, can't you? I, I'm just saying. I I don't think this needs to be everything is ruined because we can't be there in person. Obviously, you'd like to be. I wish you could be. But I'm just hoping that that's the case. You can have them set up a camera, sit around and watch them, set up a little little mini conference, ask a couple questions, how you doings, whatever. You know, go about your day. But again, we'll, we'll see how that all turns out. Apparently, that was not the case for UW. All 32 teams were in attendance for the uh, Wisconsin Pro Day. They keep saying UW. That can be confusing because... That is the more generic term for Washington, but if you live in Wisconsin, UW is Wisconsin. 
So all 32 teams represented it. So it's probably more of the small schools, the bigger schools, at least for now. Um, everybody is still in attendance. We'll see how that goes going forward. But again, congrats to Mr. Cephas. In other news, Mr. Elliot Wolf finally got a job. Kind of figured it was just a matter of time. Unfortunately, it is with the New England Patriots. Now, for, for Wolf, I think that's fantastic because now Elliot Wolf has worked under some of the best in the abs- the absolute best in the business. Obviously, his dad and then Ted Thompson. He's worked with Brian Gutekunst, so obviously, you know, he learns from people. You know, and, and that, that's the other thing. The, the staff that was in Green Bay is ridiculous. The people that have gone on from there to be GMs in other places, like Reggie McKenzie, who now I don't think is a GM anymore, uh, John Schneider, the GM of the Seahawks. I mean, the, the wealth of knowledge he learned. And now to be able to go to the Patriots, which is sort of the the other side of things, this other place where people go to have careers that are, you know, a varying success. But to learn from Bill Belichick, who obviously is, you know, I don't know that he's necessarily quite on the same tier in terms of player evaluation. I mean, it's, it's a different thing. He does a fantastic job. I'm not trying to take away from him. But I, it, it almost seems like it's a different skill set. So it's good for Elliot Wolf to get that aspect of it. You know, he's a guy that has mastered how do you structure and build a team despite having very limited resources. All right, we, we never pick early. We're, we're picking in the 30s almost every year. So it's it's how do you... And, and granted, the Packers did that too, but it's it's even maybe to a, a larger degree. So he's, he's getting a great education. So I guess congrats to Elliot Wolf as well. Um, in other news, and this is, um, it's not great news, but it's, it's somewhat expected. This is uh, via Charles Robinson um, on Twitter of Yahoo Sports. He says, talking about, first of all, Cowboys cornerback Byron Jones. The market is starting at 16 to 70, 17 million per season, according to teams I've spoken to. So again, in terms of sources and reliability, when you're talking specifically to teams, that's a reliable source. Beyond that, he says conservative market on Packers right tackle Brian Balaga is projecting to be 12 million per year. He said right tackle is about to get paid. I still think that's disrespectful. Remember, it was a year ago, right tackles were being paid $18 million. Right, Lane Johnson. At 29 years old, which is one year younger than Brian Balaga this year, signed a contract as a right tackle for $18 million a year. Trent Brown, obviously a, a, a lot younger, but is not as good. I don't care what anybody says. He's not as good as Brian Balaga. Last year, so again, to bring it up to today's standards, tack on about a year. So for, if you're going to give him a Lane Johnson contract, you're paying about $19 million bucks. If you want to give a Trent Brown contract in 2020, it's about $17.5 million. Jawan James in today's dollars was close to $14 million. Again, younger, but also not as good. So, I, I mean, it's a, it's a big number. But remember, the, the contracts for right tackles have already caught up to left tackle. The, the concept of right tackles being as important to left tackles is not really even super debatable anymore. We know that pass rushers line up on both sides. I understand the blind side aspect of it, but in terms of protecting the quarterback, what it doesn't really matter if it's coming from your back or your front. you got to keep the guy clean. And if the best pass rushers are lining up across from your right tackle, to say that the left tackle is still more important is silly. Well, at least his, you know, Khalil Mack just smoked him right in the mouth, but at least he didn't. At least he saw it coming. That's not how that works. The contracts have caught up. $18 million is the going rate for right tackles and left tackles in terms of, of top of the market, which, again, if we adjust that for 20 20 dollars which is roughly about upping at a million dollars it's 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 at around 19 million so again i'm i'm i you know 10 million seems ridiculous to me that's a slap in the face to literally one of the best tackles in all of football so you know it, it's bad news because i i just the packers don't like to give these contracts even for good players they don't like giving third contracts and if it's if the the floor for his his market is 12 million dollars it just pushes me further and further in the direction of the Packers are not going to re-sign him, which makes me obviously very sad and concerned for Aaron Rodgers' health and safety. But we'll see. I, you know, as far as I know, at this point, it still has not. Um, there, there have not been any conversations. But there's going to have to be very soon because as of Wednesday, unless it gets pushed back, which a lot of people, I don't understand the point of pushing this back. A lot of people are saying let's just push everything back because of this. First of all, do we actually think this is going to be? The, the virus thing is going to be gone in a month? I don't think so. It's not impossible, depending on who you listen to, and I don't want to get into a debate. I don't care. It's already getting better in certain areas, like the origination of it in China. It's actually already getting better in China. I don't, I don't know. If I'm not in China. I don't know. I'm saying maybe. 
I, I just, I don't think this goes away in, in a couple of weeks or a month. So pushing it back is not going to fix anything. It just means we're going to have to push it back the next time. And it's unnecessary. What, 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 why? You can't pick up your phone and call a guy and say, I want to call his agent and say, I want to give him this much money. And then the agent says, okay, sounds good. And then you sign something like you, you, you just can't be in the same room with two people. Well, I don't want him to have to fly out here. Fine. Then take the train drive. Can you drive here? Or I'll tell you what, just stay there. It's fine. Stay there. We'll fax you a copy of the contract for you to sign. I just, I mean, come on now. Precautions are fine, but that doesn't mean you have to be stupid. Like, we literally can't do anything because of the coronavirus, even though it doesn't even correlate to having a virus. I, I, we just couldn't be bothered to pick up the phone and make phone calls. I hear it transmits through the telephone wires. Stop it. Stop it. Free agency is on Wednesday. Do not take that away from me. Also, I believe Monday is when the deadline for... Everything is going to be super crazy, assuming nothing gets pushed back, because everybody's waiting to franchise certain people out until after the CBA. Presumably, that's going to be done on Saturday. So on Saturday, that gets done, we get an answer. Immediately after that, you're going to see a flurry of news. Absolute flurry, because teams are going to go, all right, quick, franchise, all this stuff, because your deadline is in a couple days. That is going to set off a flurry of, okay, now this team has this person, this team has released this person, because that's another shoe waiting to fall. You're going to hear about contract negotiations starting up. You're going to hear about rumors about reaching out to this guy, because now we got to do this, and we got to do a little, 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 It's going to be crazy. Assuming there's actually a conclusion, which the way things are going this entire year, that somehow this CBA thing is not going to be resolved, and then the, the push they're going to push back the, everything and we're just going to be stuck in dead zone forever. And then there won't be a draft, and then there... Eh. Stupid virus. Ruining everything fun. But anyways, hopefully we'll be getting a lot of answers to this very, very soon. And I'm still I'm still hopeful and slightly optimistic, and I know maybe I'll go back and try to do another contract kind of thing to show how this can all work out. I know I've given specific numbers in terms of individual players, like you can do this and you can do that. Obviously, there's a limit to how many of these things you can do at the same time before you run out of money. But to try to, or at least look at it, if Balaga gets $12 million, and maybe if $12 million is the floor, that means that would be the Packers price, because usually team players will, you know, if, if this is your floor, you'll offer your floor to the team unless you just hate your team, but I don't think Balaga hates it here. I'm still optimistic that a phone call will be made once we start to get more information. And again, starting after the CBA thing is hopefully resolved on Saturday, the shoes start to fall. And a lot of it is just teams not just waiting to figure out what they're going to do for themselves, but finding out what other teams are going to do. So it just has this, with every move, there's a ripple effect that goes out, right? This person is going to be franchised, so they're no longer available. Or you pick up the phone and say, look, are you willing to trade him now that you've tagged him? If not, okay, that's not an option. Plan B, plan C, Plan D. We we got to figure this out. All right, this isn't working. Get on the phone. Call Brian right now. Balaga. We got to work something out because the things are just not going as we had hoped. We need to work something out, right? We don't know yet. Point is, things are about to get a lot more fun. Also, I know I say a lot of things and don't follow through. What I'm thinking about doing, because hopefully there's going to be a lot of breaking news coming in the next week, rather than doing emergency podcast episodes, I'm considering. I don't know, because it's not really a thing that I do, doing sort of breaking news, podcasty type things, but putting it on Instagram instead of uploading it as a podcast. So, if you aren't following on Instagram, it is simply Packernet Podcast on Instagram. That's that's the name. Anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Thursday. Enjoy your day. Wash your hands. Be nice to everybody. Stop clogging up my Twitter timeline with your crabbiness and we'll be back here tomorrow to talk more Packers news. Have a good one. Bye-bye.